Merci, Marc. Um, okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. Marc dit à moi, uh, je dois uh, présenter uh, en français. Uh, alors, uh, mauvais l'école secondaire français. No, no, just kidding. Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I grew up in, in New York uh, and live in Rochester now, upstate. This is actually my first time in, in Montreal, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say. Uh, so it's, it's great to come up here and meet with Mark and, and see the city. So I want to talk a little bit about um, one environmental uh, exposure in particular, one toxicant. It's kind of a model uh, for this talk, and, and that's PCBs, and, and I'll get into that a little bit. And the outcome that, um, one of the outcomes that I'm interested in looking at is vaccine response. And the reason that we think about vaccine response as a, as a useful endpoint in, in epi studies is, so what we would really want to know, uh, if you kind of look at the very long end of things, is whether these environmental toxicants result in more morbidity, more clinical morbidity, maybe more respiratory infection, uh, autoimmune disease, and things like that. The problem is that those studies are difficult to do from a statistical power perspective, right? You have to generate enough cases of these outcomes, uh, and if you're following a group of individuals prospectively, that gets difficult uh, to do. So we really kind of borrowed this paradigm from animal studies that used uh, response to vaccination as sort of a, a, a gold standard endpoint uh, to look at immunotoxicity. So what I'm going to talk about today um, is vaccine response uh, in, relation to, in relation to PCBs. And just to kind of orient you a little bit to the immune system, uh, I'm not an immunologist, but I'll give you just a little brief overview. Uh, so you can think about the immune system uh, functioning normally. When it doesn't, you can think of mm, maybe three different types of abnormal functioning. So you can have things like hypersensitivities, uh, which contribute to things like uh, allergy, asthma. So this is kind of an inappropriate response to an antigen. So an inappropriate response to food or uh, dust or some kind of uh, antigen. So you have those, uh, the hyper-responsiveness of the immune system leading to things uh, like asthma and allergy. You can also think of kind of another arm of the immune system dealing with autoimmunity. Okay, so this uh, kind of problems with recognizing self-antigens. And those eventually lead to uh, immune disorders like um, uh, SLE, so uh, lupus, things like that. What we're really focusing on here is immune suppression, okay? So suppression of the immune system. So the body's having difficulty clearing a pathogen, okay? So if you think about that, that should result in more morbidity. That should also uh, result in uh, an attenuated immune response to vaccination, okay? So uh, the vaccination, when you get the vaccination, your body isn't producing the same amount of antibodies as, as it as it should. So what I'm going to be talking about are PCBs and uh, response to BCG, which is the vaccine given uh, for tuberculosis. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit. So the motivation comes from really a lot of animal research led to, uh, led to moving this into a, a, a human model. So if you look at the animal research on PCBs, it clearly demonstrates immune suppression, okay, through a variety of different outcomes. Um, and actually, I'm going to come back to some of this, but uh, we had some previous findings in our cohort that um, PCBs, for example, were associated with reduced thymus volume. So the thymus is the organ here in the chest that's responsible for uh, T cells, so naive uh, uh, immune cells get trafficked to the thymus, and there they're sort of uh, educated and, uh, and become T cells. So in animal studies, greater PCB exposure has been associated with a smaller thymus. Okay, so it, it actually uh, shrinks in size. And we were able to 
kind of replicate this in a human study. Uh, we didn't obviously extract the thymus, but what we did do um, is an ultrasound examination to, to measure thymus volume. So there was kind of some structural evidence that perhaps something was going on. Uh, we did look at some other outcomes, and, and I'll kind of come back to that, um, other vaccine measures. But I want to talk a little bit about PCB. So this is an interesting topic uh, for me because we were submitting grants on this, and we kind of keep coming back to this issue of who cares about PCBs. So um, PCBs were a chemical used in the United States and worldwide um, in the U.S. until the 80s, in other parts of the world uh, much longer. They're very persistent. I know some of you take uh, courses with uh, Dr. Werner, and he's, he's probably mentioned these. Uh, it falls into the persistent organic pollutant category. So things like DDT, uh, PCBs, perfluorinated compounds, which are the, the Scotchgard and, and Teflon products, those type of items, they tend to stick around for a while. So, um, for example, the half-life in humans is probably, for common congeners, maybe in serum three, five years, maybe even a little bit longer. So even though we've, we've ceased using these, they're, they're still sticking around, okay? They're still uh, in measurable concentrations. Uh, yeah, so I say for some of these, it's even more than 10 years. So even though they've been banned for uh, a considerably long time, uh, the U.S. government, uh, ATSDR, which is a branch of the CDC, still considers uh, these, you know, important to study. So they, they do a ranking of, of chemicals in terms of their kind of frequency in the environment. Uh, and so they're, they're still relevant. And then there are some other bits of evidence. Uh, concentrations in schools uh, exceed some allowable limits set by EPA. Uh, and some parts of the world levels are uh, increasing. And I, I just saw a study uh, done in the United States where levels have basically remained flat uh, for some PCB congeners um, <clears throat> for the last 20 or so years. So I'll just give you a, a quick uh, chemistry lesson here. So how many of you have heard of dioxin? <laughs> Mark, really? Can't believe it. Okay, so uh, usually when people say dioxin, they're referring to this, this 2378 TCDD. And uh, some of you may be familiar with this. This was an additive or a part of Agent Orange, which uh, the U.S. government used in Vietnam as a, as a defoliant. Uh, so they would spray in the, in the jungle to, uh, to get rid of the leaves and, and trees to make it easier for America to... No, anyway, okay, I won't go there. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, a known carcinogen, TCDD, with very clear uh, immune effects, okay? And part of the concern about PCBs, besides their persistence, is their chemical, uh, their structural similarity uh, to dioxin, okay? And you can, there are, what, 208 or 209 congeners? I always forget. I think it's 209 different PCB congeners. So they're, they're labeled and uh, they're numbered, I should say. And it's based on their chemistry, okay? So you can have chlorine substitutions at, at different uh, hydrogens, okay? And in this case, um, you have two chlorines on these molecules. And so what happens is these chlorines compared with hydrogens are relatively large. So if you think about this molecule, what that does is these chlorines here cause this chemical to kind of rotate in space like this, okay? So that these chlorines don't really bump into each other. The absence of that, um, you have uh, a pretty flat molecule. This looks a lot like TCDD. Okay, so we call these PCBs dioxin-like PCBs. You may have heard this nomenclature before. And this is the, the reason. Their structural similarity looks, looks pretty close. So this is the, the compound that we're, we're, uh, we're discussing today. And I did some cute animations, which I'm going to ignore. So one of the outcomes that we've looked at is response to BCG. So I mentioned that BCG is the vaccine that we that we give uh, to prevent tuberculosis. 
Mostly in the world, uh, it's used to prevent uh, kind of childhood, childhood tuberculosis, less so adult uh, tuberculosis. BCG protection, though, protection from this vaccine is pretty variable. Uh, it's not uh, great. A lot of people who still receive the vaccine, so the effectiveness is not as good as it could be. And so one of the um, thoughts about studying these uh, vaccines is that perhaps environmental uh, exposures can explain some of this. So, you know, BCG uh, effectiveness does vary by geography. There are some other environmental um, uh, determinants of it as well, uh, not BCG, but for example, smoking and influenza is well documented. Okay. So uh, we're going to ignore this. This is a little bit in the weeds, but TB is still a major global public health issue. Okay. So if you look at these disability adjusted life years, it's the 13th leading cause of all disability adjusted life years in the world. Okay. So that's pretty substantial. So uh, about 2% of all disability uh, adjusted life years. Okay. So the study I'm going to talk to you about uh, is in the Slovak Republic. And uh, TB incidence is the highest in the eastern part of the country, and it's actually where we uh, did our study where environmental contamination is highest. And this is sort of a, an ecological statement, but it's uh, nevertheless kind of curious. Um, also talk about the Roma. This is the kind of gypsy population uh, in Europe, and they account for most of the new cases of, of TB. Um, and we have about 20% of our, our sample, um, our Roma families, but they account for less than 2% of the population. So uh, they're, they're very overrepresented in terms of uh, disease burden. So this is Slovakia. When I was a kid, it was Czechoslovakia. Okay, so it's sandwiched between Poland and Hungary. It's a Landlocked state, uh, population is about 5 million people. They speak Slovak, which sounds a lot like Czech, uh, a little bit different. And the study that we did is in the eastern part uh, in these two districts. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, why we're choosing this particular population. So Slovakia was under communistic control uh, until the late 80s, early 90s. As a result, there was not great uh, environmental standards. Um, and in the eastern part of the country, they produced a lot of PCBs. So does anybody know why, what PCBs are used for, were used for commercially? No? Electrical components? Yeah, yeah. So they're, um, they're very convenient because they're viscous like an oil, uh, but they're not flammable. Okay, so if you think about needing to lubricate an item uh, in electronic equipment but not have it be flammable, PCBs were, were really good for that. So they were in these big electrical capacitors. Uh, they were used in, you know, lots of other things. Carbonless copy paper. Uh, this goes back to when I was a kid and I imagine getting PCBs from using carbonless copy paper. Uh, but they were added to a lot of uh, compounds as well. They were added to paint to make it a little more durable. So in the eastern part of Slovakia, they had a manufacturing facility for these. Um, they only exported about half of it, so they used quite a bit of it internally. This is, this is a lot of PCBs, okay? And some previous studies have documented that there are higher PCB concentrations in Slovakia compared with the rest of the EU, and concentrations in this eastern part uh, are about three times greater than the rest of, of the Slovak Republic. So this is a, a photo um, of the former manufacturing facility. They've repurposed it. Uh, it has that sort of Soviet look to it. Um, it's something about like your future partner and I, I, I can't remember what this said, but uh, they're not producing PCBs there anymore, uh, but it, it sort of gives you a flavor uh, of the facility. So the facility is located uh, in the upper left hand corner here and you can maybe see that there's a river it's not a big river but there is a river that flows from north to south and into this lake 
which is a large recreational lake. Um, it's actually, I think I have a slide next. Yeah, I do. Uh, so it's a large recreational lake. And the town that we, rec uh, we recruited some participants from for the high exposed group was this uh, Mikolose. Okay, so not a large city by any means. But because of the kind of dynamics of this, uh, a lot of the effluent from the waste from the facility came down the river into the sediments. And if you look at, uh, and it has been done, if you measure sediments in here for PCBs, they're extremely high. Okay. The exposure route is kind of, there's a bit of contention about how people exactly are exposed to these. Usually we think about diet. These are lipophilic compounds, so they hang out in fatty uh, substances, so meat, milk. Um, but there's also probably some airborne uh, exposure as well. Okay, so really, uh, these folks are kind of um, right in the heart of it. And we've done some GIS coding where you know, we're able to plot everyone's residence, and there's a pretty clear gradient between uh, exposure level and proximity to the uh, facility. So the closer you are, the higher the exposure. So this is the lake I was talking about here at the, at the end. It's Zemplinska Shirova. They call it uh, like the Slovak Sea. <laughs> uh, it's a landlocked country, so you know, there's not a lot of water to go around uh, for recreation. So uh, it's, it's kind of like, I hate to say this, but Disneyland for Slovaks. A lot of people go here in the summer and vacation here. Uh, so, and a lot of people fish um, out of this. Uh, body of water as well. So I'm telling you that these PCB concentrations are higher, but how much higher? So this is a figure modified from uh, a mentor of mine, and it's looking at PCB 153, which is kind of a, an indicator PCB. It's usually the most uh, prevalent PCB in humans. And so these studies are arranged from top to bottom in terms of the oldest studies, okay, so the 11 city study in the U.S., uh, this is the, so that's the Collaborative Perinatal Project, and then the CHDS, uh, North Carolina, Michigan, and then we have some European studies here, and the time gets more and more contemporary. So what would you expect? I mean, if, if this compound is, is being phased out, what would you generally expect to see here? Yeah, you'd, you'd expect to see these shifting to the left, and they, and they generally do, you can see. These uh, last two, though, uh, we have this uh, population uh, Mark and I were just talking about in northern Quebec uh, who eat, um, what are they eating? Uh, sea mammals, I guess, right? Yeah, so eating a lot of uh, lipids where these PCBs are bound, okay, so still higher concentrations. In the Faroe Islands, they eat a whale meat, whale blubber, uh, and so they're, they're pretty high exposed. So here we are in Slovakia. The median is about 150 nanograms per gram serum lipid. So we have this denominator here because uh, they're uh, dissolved in lipid essentially, so it's a way to standardize the measurement. So concentrations in Slovakia today are about where they were in the US in the 50s and 60s when we were still using these compounds. Okay. So pretty high. Uh, if you look at N. Haynes data from the United States, the median in pregnant women is somewhere about five or eight nanograms per gram. So in our population at that time, in our population is about 150. Okay, so uh, the other thing I'll point out is there's a pretty good range uh, variability in terms of our exposure, which if you're doing an epidemiologic study, you know, allows more statistical power if you have this uh, range in your exposure. Okay, so the, the boring epidemiology, and I'm an epidemiologist, so, so we recruited uh, pregnant women between 02 and 04 at the time they came to the hospital to deliver. Uh, just some exclusion criteria, so more than four previous births, anyone know, it's kind of two reasons we did this, why we would exclude women with more than four previous births, any guesses? Right? Exactly. So 
um, women excrete these lipophilic compounds directly to the fetus during pregnancy and then during breastfeeding. Okay, so their body burden goes down exactly. And then sort of the other uh, issue is, you know, if you already have four kids, you're probably pretty busy and you know, having a fifth and bringing them into our study visits is probably a bit much. Um, and again, fewer than five years in their district, we, we wanted to ensure that they were kind of, you know, loaded up. Um, we had about 1,100 women, okay? So fairly large, fairly large study. So um, we collected blood from the mother, cord blood, collected lots of information about her pregnancy, and then at six months, which is the follow-up I'm going to be talking about, um, we had about 86% still participating, and we collected blood from the infant in order to do the antibody measurement. Okay? So in Slovakia, BCG, the vaccine is given uh, to the infant at birth. And uh, it's very convenient because moms have a mandatory, I believe it's five-day stay in the hospital. So it's a good time to kind of recruit subjects, to have them fill out forms, uh, it's not like in the U.S. where, you know, you come in and, you know, right out the door. In fact, we were talking about maternity leave today, and uh, we get six weeks of maternity leave, and he was telling me you all get 50 or something, so it's nice. Um, so the BCG vaccine is given at birth, and then we're collecting blood at, at six months from the infant. I'll present some data um, on PBPK models. So... Um, Mark was involved in this before he and I uh, kind of got connected, and he was using data from this study to develop these uh, PBPK models. So I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard about this. This is really nice work, but it allows us to, to uh, capture some other exposure estimates. So, for example, we may only measure levels, so this is time in our cohort, the infant's age and then let's say PCB uh, concentration. So we have only measured PCB concentrations at three time points, but through these, uh, through these models, uh, he's able to develop this individual, kind of an individual curve for everyone. So because of this, it allows multiple um, uh, exposure elements. So you can have something like total exposure, which would be you know, like area under the curve, you could have peak exposure, which, you know, it happens to occur around, uh, around the measured concentration. And you can have kind of more specific age levels. So even though we didn't measure uh, anything in here, we could still estimate what the exposure is likely to be. Okay, so this was uh, kind of a nice addition to the already, you know, measured levels that we had. That were, we drew blood and measured it. So I'll, I'll talk about these results uh, a little bit. And our, uh, our grant review is always, always love that we had this in. So, all right. So just to kind of diagram this out, the exposure we're interested in, PCBs. So we've measured it in, in mom, we measured it in cord, and at six months. Okay. Vaccine response, so the vaccine is given here at birth and we're, we're looking at the response out at, at six months of age in the infant. So in addition, I'll, I'll talk about these, but I'll also be showing you the data from the, the PBPK models that, that Mark uh, did. Okay. This is a bit TMI, but I'm only saying this uh, for those of you who are familiar with analytic chemistry. Uh, back in the day, we were using uh, GCECD, which is an older technology, and, and now you would use mass spec. So some of these congeners we weren't able to quantitate as well as, as we could, but this is a fairly uh, labor-intensive process. You can do about 10 samples a day. Uh, so if you think about 1,100 women with a sample at uh, birth and then cord blood in six months, uh, this takes quite a bit of time. <clears throat> I'll just mention, so how we measure some people are probably not familiar with an ELISA, so this is a 96 well plate. These are individual samples, okay. So in some ELISAs, what you would do is you would coat the plate with antigen, 
So in this case, you would code it with actual BCG or, uh, yeah, with BCG. Then on top of that, you would add an individual serum. Okay, so if the person has antibodies to BCG, it's going to stick. It's going to recognize that BCG on the plate and stick. Okay. Then what you do is you, you add on this uh, thing that fluoresces. So the darker it is, the more antigen, the more antibodies are in the serum. Okay, because more of it is sticking to the plate. So these would be individuals, different dilutions. And we looked at both IgA and IgG specific antibodies. The reason for that is really an, an immunologic uh, issue. So IgA does not cross the placenta. Okay, it might. Uh, there's some debate, but generally not a lot of IgA crosses the placenta. So we'll keep that in mind. We ended up only being able to analyze about, about half of the infants that followed up. The reason for this, anybody can guess? Well, we need blood from six-month-olds. And so once you already measure PCBs, which takes quite a bit of volume, you know, there's not uh, necessarily a lot left to do Excuse me, much else with. <clears throat> Um, for the epidemiologically inclined, you know, we selected uh, confounders based on directed acyclic graphs, so DAGs. Some of you may be learning about this if you're epi students. Um, what we ended up adjusting for was pretty similar uh, ethnicity, so Slovak or Roma, maternal age, education, parity, and, and smoking. So the results that I'll present are all, are all adjusted. Okay. So this is your typical table one results here. And uh, not too much of this is particularly uh, interesting, but there are a few things I want to highlight. So only 4% of women reported no breastfeeding. So they're a, they're a pretty heavy population when it comes to, uh, to breastfeeding. And about 20% were the, the Roma minority. Uh, quite a bit higher than what you would expect, at least in the, in the U.S., 28% of women reported smoking during pregnancy. Um, I'm assuming it's a lot lower here uh, than 28%. And most of our women were between uh, 20 and 30. So pretty typical in terms of, you know, pregnant women, uh, but, you know, definitely more smoking and, and definitely breastfeeders. Okay, so just again, this is just showing by comparison. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. It's a little dense. So here are the results from the measured concentration. So I'm going to walk you through this slide. There's a lot here. So we had three different exposures, maternal PCB-153, cord PCB-153, and six month in the infant, okay? And the outcome here is six-month BCG. So you can think about this, these results as sort of a cross-sectional analysis between the six-month PCB and the six-month BCG. This is mom and this is cord. I'm showing results for two congeners. One I said was non-dioxin-like, one which is dioxin-like. And we did this just to compare to see whether results were different. And they, they really weren't too different between the, the two congeners. Uh, and on the y-axis, what I'm showing you here is the difference in antibody response between the 25th and the 75th percentile of each of these exposure levels. So if we just go and interpret, say, what a terrible one to pick, but we'll pick the first one. <laughs> so um, there was basically no difference between the 25th and the 75th percentile of maternal PCB-153 okay, for IgG-specific BCG. This would be for IgA-specific, et cetera. So essentially, the pattern of results that you see here is that this is where the action seems to be, this cross-sectional analysis. The concentrations in the infant at six months are what really predict vaccine response, not mom and not cord, but really six months. The other thing to note from this, the effect sizes are really large, okay? So this is a percent difference, so it's almost 35%. So 
So if you compare kids uh, at the 75th percentile to the 25th percentile in terms of their exposure, their BCG response is about 35% lower, 35% less antibody. Okay, so it's, it's pretty substantial. How am I doing on time? Oh, okay. Look at that. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing to note. Any epidemiology students in here? No? Biostat? Okay. No? All right. The confidence limits are also pretty narrow here. Okay, they're, they're pretty narrow. So it, it suggests that, you know, this is not due, not due to chance. More interesting results. So I mentioned the PBPK modeling that, that Mark did. So remember, we just had mom, cord, and six month. But with the PBPK model, we were able to, Mark was able to estimate uh, month-specific concentrations. Also an AUC, so an area under that individual's PCB curve, and also their peak concentration. Okay? And this is uh, pre and postnatal, and this is postnatal. We can just focus on this. What you see here is that this association becomes stronger and stronger as you get closer to the six month uh, to the six month PCB concentration. Okay? So these early concentrations, which are pretty close to what mom had. Not so influential, but you see as you get closer to the six-month time point, the concentration, uh, the association gets stronger. So it seems to be this cross-sectional uh, association. Like any good epidemiologist, we did some sensitivity analyses. Um, and these are a whole bunch of different adjustments. Uh, and I won't go into this unless anyone's interested, but basically they they stay pretty flat. There's not much difference. Um, I have to say these um, kind of two studies in my life, I've been really overly very impressed with the results. And I thought there must be something wrong. So the first study was on lead exposure and in, in neurodevelopment, where the uh, effect estimates were huge. And then I and then this study. So I have to say these effect estimates are large and they're very precise. And you know, you do a study like this and you think, I must have done something wrong, something must be coded incorrectly. Um, but we really, we really beat this model up to make sure that, you know, it wasn't confounding or something that, that we weren't accounting for. So I want to just talk a little bit about this. This is an immunologic phenomenon. So recall that I said maternal concentrations didn't seem to matter too much. It was really the child's six month. So there's lots of hypotheses about what might explain that finding. Okay. So one hypothesis is that, I'm actually debating whether I want to walk through this. This gets a little tricky. We'll come back to this if people have questions. So. What did we find? So people are exposed to these PCBs. We observed in previous studies that um, their thymus size was, was smaller, which suggested that there's something going on immunologically. We also had you know, lots of studies, not us personally, but lots of studies that had been done previously with really strong findings from, from animals. So we saw these large inverse associations, okay? So higher PCBs, lower response to vaccination, okay? It was the concurrent PCB concentration, okay? And it wasn't the mom. We saw this in the, in the thymus uh, results as well. The question is kind of why is this? Um, I have some ideas, you know, one, I, one thought is that really you're not measuring uh, the critical exposure is really the, the infant exposure in driving the infant's immune response. It's not so much mom, it's what that concentration is closer to the time of, of vaccination uh, measurement. The results were consistent for IgG and IgA, meaning if you take a look at these, uh, you can see that you know, basically they don't vary too much. They're pretty similar. 
That's important because, as I mentioned, IgA doesn't cross the placenta. So if IgA doesn't cross the placenta, uh, if we, let me walk this back. So it could be the result of mom's suppressed antibody response, okay, because IgG does cross the placenta. So you could make the argument that really what's going on is that maternal PCBs are high, they suppress mom's BCG response, okay, and that's really what you're measuring, okay. But since IgA doesn't cross the placenta, okay, so mom's PCB concentrations are high, her uh, BCG is low, but BCG doesn't cross the placenta. So really what you're measuring is the infant's response, okay. So that suggests then that what we're really measuring here is the infant and not so much mom, okay. This is why we, we tease these out, okay. And as Mark would say, we have dose and time dependent association. So dose matters if you look at the PBPK model, okay. So, you know, dose matters in terms of peak. Dose also, I mean, and there is just dose response here. And also the time matters, okay. So as you get closer to the measurement, uh, you see stronger associations. Um, okay, I'll uh, just mention my collaborators here. So obviously uh, Mark who did the PBPK modeling, which was uh, really, um, really adds a lot to these studies in terms of exposure assessment. So you know, as an environmental epidemiologist, you're your main worry is exposure assessment, right? And this is a, a nice mechanism to uh, kind of reduce misclassification, potential misclassification. So lots of uh, colleagues in Slovakia who've helped with this. Um, the original PIs of the study, um, where's Irva? Yeah, was uh, Irva hertz picciotto who's a very senior environmental epidemiologist. My colleagues in Slovakia, um, I should mention, uh, these are my colleagues in Slovakia who did uh, most of the analytic chemistry. They look very serious. They're, they're very nice people, but they look very serious. Um, and then this is uh, my colleague Paige Lawrence, who's an immunotoxicologist in, in her lab that, that did a lot of the, uh, the assays in the study. And then we have uh, some funding from the U.S. government and uh, I'll take any questions that you might have about this, about uh, immunologic mechanisms or, or anything else. Thanks.